June 13, 1970, the 24 hours of Le Mans. Rain pours down as engines fire to life. On the grid, four Porsche 917s rev their unconventional yet lethal 4.5 liter flat 12s. They're here for victory, having been humiliated during their debut a year prior. Against them are their greatest opponents, Ferrari and Ford. The prancing horse armed with five of their latest 512 prototypes Ford with privateer team's GT40s, the same cars that crushed Porsche last year. The downpour doesn't matter. The lights go out. Le Mans begins. Ferrari takes an early lead, with the 512 set the pace. Porsche only starts catching up after four hours when two Ferraris crash. After a grueling battle for the leading place at the 16-hour mark, Ferrari, driven by Jackie Ix, suffers serious engine issues and power loss. He heads to the pits, rejoining the race an hour later. By this time, it was the only factory-backed Ferrari left in the race. The other two were already gone, and the last Ford retired two hours earlier. Despite significant issues, Jackie Ix refuses to give up, pushing for victory. But at the 18-hour mark, the inevitable happens. Ferrari's V12 gives out completely. Their final factory entry retires. When the checkered flag waves, seven of the top 10 finishers are Porsches. The best finish Ferrari secured was fourth place, and it was from a privateer team. That is total dominance. Porsche's 917 was so good that it crushed the competition for two years straight until the FIA outlawed the prototype. But Porsche wasn't done yet. The taste of victory left him hungry for more and they were gonna repeat their success in the coming decade. Racing has always been in Porsche's DNA, whether they were battling death traps on wheels or pushing against the relentless ticking clock, competition fueled their every move. In the 1980s, Porsche was ready to prove themselves once again. After Renault shattered their Le Mans streak in 1978 and a small privateer handed him their asses the following year in a car named after him, Porsche was set on one thing, revenge. And in their pursuit of that, they didn't just stage the greatest comeback. They built a machine that would rule prototype racing for nearly a decade, set a record that stood 35 years, and take the life of a driver who could have rewritten F1 history. This is the story of the Porsche 956. In the late 70s, the future of Group 6 racing wasn't looking great. The series was getting too expensive, and major teams like Ferrari, Alfa Romeo, and Matra pulled out of prototype racing. Even Porsche started stepping back after getting embarrassed at Le Mans two years in a row. Instead, they shifted focus to turbocharged GT cars, specifically the Porsche 935, which competed in the lower Group 5 Special Production Cars Championship. And that move paid off. The 935 crushed the competition, winning four consecutive world championships. So dominant was the 935 that in 1979, it even defeated the more advanced Group 6 prototypes while still running under Group 5 regulations. Porsche did develop a proper Group 6 prototype, the 936, which clinched the championship in 1981. But by then, both Group 5 and Group 6 were losing steam. Smaller manufacturers couldn't keep up with the dominant brands, leading to predictable races and less variety on the grid. The FIA wanted to shake things up and get more manufacturers involved. So, in 1982, they scrapped the old classes and introduced a new system, Group N, A, B, and C. Group N was for nearly stock production cars with minimal modifications. Group A was for performance-oriented touring cars with more serious upgrades. Then came the wild ones, Group B and C. These were the most extreme racing classes, where engineers' wildest dreams became reality. It was as crazy as racing gets, with insanely powerful, ultra-lightweight cars and almost no regulations. It's fair to say they're the reason some of the greatest sports cars of the 80s even exist. Today, Group B is famous for its rally monsters, but interestingly, the regulations also allowed manufacturers to build circuit racing cars. The thing is, almost no one did. Instead, nearly every major manufacturer aiming for top-level racing focused on Group C prototypes, and Porsche was no exception. They went all in on this project. 
starting with an engine that had already proven itself, the 2.65 liter turbocharged flat six from the 936 prototype. Originally developed for IndyCar, it pushed out 635 horsepower. And thanks to the new aluminum monocoque chassis, the prototype weighed just 800 kilogram, which is about the same as a modern F1 car. But the biggest difference between the 956 and its predecessors was its efficiency. See, older prototypes burned through fuel like crazy. During a single Le Mans race, they could guzzle around 2,500 liters of fuel. Back in Group 6, efficiency didn't matter victory did, and that was one of the reasons the series started to decline. Unlimited fuel meant sky-high costs, and with the oil crisis in the background, things only got worse. FIA's solution for prototype racing was simple. Limit fuel consumption to 500 liters per race. The main goal was, of course, to cut costs, but also to slow the cars down. Because even in an era where safety was more of a suggestion than a rule, watching Group 6 prototypes scream down the Mulsanne Strait at 380 km per hour was concerning, to say the least. But that didn't work. The new prototypes were just as fast, if not faster, than the old ones. But what did work, though, was forcing manufacturers to build more efficient engines, which in most cases meant sacrificing power. To make up for it, manufacturers turned to another weapon, aerodynamics. Unlike in F1, ground effect wasn't banned in Group C, so teams took full advantage of it, and so did Porsche. Their new 956 prototype generated nearly three times more downforce than the legendary 917 that had dominated Le Mans a decade earlier. In fact, at 321 kilometers per hour, the downforce was so strong that, theoretically, the 956 could drive upside down on the ceiling. That's exactly why if you visit the Porsche Museum in Stuttgart, you'll see one mounted to the ceiling. The prototype had these tunnels underneath that literally sucked it to the ground, letting it tear through corners at ridiculous speeds. And the results spoke for themselves. Despite missing the second round at the Nürburgring in 1982, the Porsche 956 took the championship, the first ever for Group C. But the real highlight was an absolutely dominant Le Mans performance, where Porsche 956s finished first, second, and third. It was a repeat of Porsche's success from a decade earlier, but on a whole different scale. That year, they took 9 out of 10 podium finishes. Right now, you're watching footage from a Porsche 956 flying around the Nürburgring during qualifying for the 1983 season of a 1,000-kilometer Nürburgring. F1 had already stopped racing at the Green Hell seven years earlier, but Group C prototypes? They were still allowed, which made no sense because they were even faster than the F1 cars Nicky Lauda and James Hunt had raced there before. When talking about the Porsche 956 at Nürburgring, especially the 83 season, you just have to mention Stefan Bullock. Porsche hired him in 1982 to compete in the World Endurance Championship for the 1983 season. And in just his third race weekend with the 956, during qualifying for the race, Belloff set an unbelievable lap record of 6.11.13. Even reigning F1 champion Kiki Rosberg, driving the same car, lapped nearly 30 seconds slower. That record stood unbeaten until 2018. Sometimes you just know when a driver isn't good, but exceptional. Belloff was definitely one of those. Is that inter-team rivalry between the two Germans? It's a big rivalry between you two? No. No? No. Oh. Jochen? Well, what do you think it is then? It's just plain skill, I guess. So he has more skill than you? Well, he's got more skill than us, yes, I'm afraid so. No, he's very good. I mean, 6.11 is an outstanding time, and I really believe that uh, Formula One would have to stretch itself, you know, to better that time. But records aside, he still had to translate that qualifying pace into a race win. And that wasn't going to be easy. Even with an experienced co-driver like Derek Bell, a three-time Le Mans winner, their biggest competition came from other Porsche 956s. Porsche sold the car to the privateer teams, meaning plenty of these machines were on the grid. The biggest threat, however, was the other factory-backed Porsche team featuring Jochen Maas and Jackie Ix. Ix, a six-time Le Mans winner and two-time F1 runner-up, was the most decorated driver in the field. 
The race began on a drying track, and Belov almost lost positions right away. He slipped on the damp track, allowing Ricardo Patrice's Lancia and Bob Wellick's Porsche to get ahead. But he wasted no time reclaiming a spot, quickly breaking away from the pack. Soon he took the lead, and lap after lap, he gained four to five seconds on Yoke and Max, pulling further and further ahead. This wasn't just an advantage, it was total domination. But this race would reveal another side of Valor. His skill and talent were undeniable, but his raw enthusiasm behind the wheel often made him challenge not just his competitors, but also the law of physics and common sense. While other drivers frustrated and let him get away with it, the laws of physics didn't. Even with the victory practically secured, Belov refused to back off. The team told him to save fuel and slow down. In response, he set another lap record. I never, and I knew, I I, I never tried to go quicker than Stefan Belov because I knew that over an hour my lap times basically would always be the average out the same if not quicker. He just said he had these incredible moments of going electronic, electric, electronically fast. The big drama back was of course that he was using more fuel, which you mentioned earlier. And he'd come in and hand the car over to him and say, oh wow, what a drive. And I go, oh, thanks a lot, Stefan. But this time, he wouldn't get the chance to hand the car over to Bell. While pushing to the absolute limit, Belliff lost control of the Porsche 956. At the end of Fans Garden, the car caught air after a small jump, landed sideways, and spun into the barriers. The impact completely destroyed the car. Miraculously, Belliff walked away without a scratch. In the end, the Jackie X Jochen Mass team took the win, celebrating while Belliff was left wondering what could have been. However, the disappointment didn't last long. Stefan loved racing prototypes, but his main goal was to become an F1 champion. Signing with Tyrell in 1984 felt like the first real step toward that dream. During testing, he outpaced Tyrell's lead driver, Martin Brundle, by a full second. His arrival promised great things for the team, but there was a problem. The once mighty Tyrell team was stuck with the weakest engine on the grid. By 1984, almost every F1 team had switched to turbo engines, but Tyrell was still running the two-decade-old Cosworth DFV. That meant Stefan could only hope for strong finishes when raw driver skill mattered more than outright horsepower. And on June 3, 1984, all the right factors aligned. The already difficult Monaco Grand Prix started under heavy rain. This race would become legendary as the first ever duel between Elaine Prost and Ayrton Senna. Prost leading, Senna closing in. The rain was so intense that Prost, while driving past the pit lane, signaled to the race officials with his hands that conditions were too dangerous. But while the other struggled, one driver was thriving, Stefan Belloff. On the first lap, he stormed from last place to 11. By lap 26, he climbed to third overtaking Rene Arnaud's Ferrari. If the race hadn't been red flag, Belov could have fought for the victory. Even though his performance was great, it was overshadowed by the battle at the front. Despite his focus on F1, Stefan continued racing for Porsche, and unlike in F1, his career there was thriving. He won the 1984 World Sports Car Championship, outscoring both Jackie X and Derek Bell. In 1985, Porsche factory teams upgraded to the new 962, but Belloff stuck with the older 956 after moving to the privateer Brunn Motorsport team. The 956 was blisteringly fast, but safety wasn't exactly its strong suit. Unlike the new prototype, the 956 had no real crash structure. The driver's feet extended past the front axle, meaning that in a head-on collision, the first thing to take impact was the driver's leg. After several serious crashes, concerns grew over the aluminum monocoque design and front axle foot placement, leading Porsche to redesign the 962 with the driver's feet positioned further back. But for Belloff, safety wasn't a major concern. Switching to Brunn Motorsport gave him more flexibility to focus on F1, but his F1 career was about to take a major hit. After Monaco, Tyrell was caught in one of the biggest scandals in F1 history. The FIA accused the team of running their cars underweight during races and adding illegal ballast during pit stops. There were also suspicions of illegal fuel additives. As a result, Tyrell was disqualified from the entire 1984 season. 
erasing Belloff's third place finish at Monaco. Despite everything, Belloff stayed with Tyrell for the 1985 season. At the Detroit Grand Prix, he finished fourth on a track so difficult that even Ayrton Senna crashed. His performance didn't go unnoticed. Journalists claimed he was on the verge of signing a contract with Ferrari for 1986, but fate had other plans. By this time, Group C racing was booming. These prototypes were drawn crowds almost as large as F1s. One of the biggest races on the calendar was the 1,000 kilometer of Spa Franker Champs in Belgium, and Belleff was set to compete. Ricardo Patrice secured pole position in a Lancia LC2, leading the pack, with the factory Porsche 962s of Derek Bell and Jochen Maas close behind. Further back was the Porsche 956, driven by Thierry Bautzen, Stefan's new teammate. These Group C prototypes were just 10 seconds slower than the F1's turbo monsters in outright pace, but nearly matched them through the corners, especially at the infamous U Rouge. On lap 73, Belloff took over from Bautzen, who had fought his way into the lead. By the time Belloff was back on the track, he was in second place, chasing Jackie Ix's Porsche. After the leaders pitted, the fight between Belloff and Ix was now for victory. At La Source, the gap was almost non-existent. The next turn, red waters. This footage, taken from Ix's onboard camera, shows him approaching the corner, Belloff's car on the left. Ix takes his usual line into the corner, unaware that Belloff is about to attempt a daring inside pass at one of the most dangerous turns in motorsport. A split second later, their cars collide. Ix climbs out unscathed. Belloff isn't so lucky. His Porsche bursts into flames, and he's rushed to the track hospital. 24 minutes later, he's pronounced dead. His death changed racing forever. After that crash, many F1 teams banned their drivers from competing in other championships. But that didn't stop Group C from producing future stars. In 1990, another young driver made his debut behind the wheel of a shining silver Sauber Mercedes prototype. Talented, fearless, and fast as hell. His name? Michael Shoemaker. <laughs> 